All right, so now that we've discussed the basic, uh, what we know, understand at least about uh, development as far as going um, from you know, conception all the way to adulthood, as far as normal progressions go and general uh, average tendencies for those various stages and, and gender differences, um, we're gonna go back to how people tried to explain life and then we'll get some more sophisticated and contemporary uh, analyses of development. So we'll talk more about those specific stages uh, that we mentioned when we broadly went over how you develop from conception uh, all the way into adulthood. So one of the early explanations uh, came from Sigmund Freud, uh, and he's really, really early on in psychological history. Um, so Sigmund Freud, and uh, uh, he's part of a, a field of psychology referred to as psychoanalysis. So this is basically, you try to analyze uh, your mind, uh, and see what your motives are, what things you are uh, acting out, what things are being held back, and, and sort of how that's affecting your behavior and development and, and ability. We'll talk more about them when we talk about personality in a specific personality uh, analysis and, and description and field of psychoanalysis uh, when we get there. But I do want to briefly mention sort of how he laid out the life cycle uh, or developmental stages, and then of course how he uh, believed you acted out your behavior. So psychoanalysis, so he's, uh, did his, most of his research between the 1880s when he started off in the medical field uh, and going increasingly into psychological theories uh, into the, the 1930s. So Sigmund Freud, um, so before I detail these things, know that almost all of them have been disproved. But the reason why this is relevant to learn is, well A, some people do believe some of these, some of them are at least partially true, uh, as far as unconscious motives, which we'll talk about, uh, and also some of the remedies for those um, disorders, which we'll talk about when we get to psychological disorders, do actually work. Um, but mostly his contribution was kind of like Francis Gal Galton was with um, an in, uh, in intelligence test. While the, the method he used specifically in his motivations for the test were either unethical or wrong, the, uh, the idea to try to quantify and put intelligence into a testable format and a numerical, I give it a numerical value. That was the key that, that sparked this uh, study of intelligence. Same with Freud here with development. His developmental theory and stages aren't gonna be correct, but the method he uses to try to analyze and assess and, and quantify uh, and categorize life as developmental stages that almost all humans go through um, is gonna be the uh, the framework and lens through which we view development now today. Again, so his particular theories are not correct, or at least not entirely correct, but the method he used of trying to look at human development across a lifetime and find the common stages of development. So while Comrade Lorenz, of course, associated biology with maturation and development, he's going to try to um, find those developmental time spans and milestones uh, for most human beings. I forgot my water. Okay, so here are his um, uh, stages. But before I, I go into those stages, I actually got to briefly tell you kind of how he thought you developed and your behavior worked. So first of all, let me say this: uh, he developed uh, the idea of um, uh, categorizing slash tracking common human developmental stages uh, or a timeline. So we basically believe, oh, ages zero to 18 months, this is what occurs normally. Uh, ages one to three, this is what should be occurring or does occur normally, so on and so forth, all the way through to uh, puberty. He guys kind of stopped at puberty, which is where the next guy, Eric Erickson, continues from, but we're talking about Freud right now. So <clears throat> that's his major contribution. And before I go into the stages, this is generally how he viewed human behavior and development. He believed, and then there is a degree of truth to this as far as unconscious motives. So unconscious meaning motives that you're not aware of. So factors that affect your behavior, what you do, that you're not consciously aware of. Oh, I like this because of this thing. Or, oh, I'm afraid of this because this happened to me. You're not aware of why, you just know you are afraid or you do this thing, you like this thing. It's, it's an unconscious thing. It's like, I like this, but why do I like this? Or I'm afraid of this, but why am I afraid of this? That's the unconscious thing. Consciously is if you can explain it, like, oh, I'm afraid of heights because I 
fell off a ladder when I was a kid and now I'm afraid of or something like that. That would be a conscious awareness of your behavior. Unconscious is, I feel this way, but I don't know why. All right, so uh, he, of course, uh, theorized uh, unconscious motives, so non-rational motives, ones that we are not aware of or we can't control, so they aren't necessarily rational. Like, I know this is the best thing for me, but I don't want to do it, or I know this is bad for me, but I really do want to do it. Those are unconscious motives, ones I'm not aware of, ones that are, are rational, uh, but they absolutely affect my behavior. So unconscious motives uh, exist and drive behavior. That was his explanation for behavior. I'll put that actually behavior. Um, and he, he sort of, I'm going to oversimplify this, but just to give you the idea, he sort of broke it down into three kind of categories. Uh, he broke it down into three terms you may have heard before, the ego, the id, and the superego. So most of this is what he considered unconscious. So these are causal driving motivational systems that you're not aware of that produce your actual behavior. So the ego, this is the easy part I think, this is your actual manifested behavior. This is what you actually do. This is what's actually carried out. This is what you um, actually think, what you actually do in action, what you actually say. That's your actual behavior. Uh, it's the mechanism that carries it out. But the drives and motivations for these actions that are carried out by the ego come from the unconscious, which is mostly um, an almost entirely submit, unconscious submerged id and an almost entirely submerged unconscious superego. So here's kind of the two things. The id's more of your younger self. This is the uh, impulsive, selfish, uh, young desires. So when you're angry and you want to hit somebody as a toddler, that's the id. When you're hungry and scream out, you'll do whatever you can to take the food and steal it or just take it, not wait your turn, whatever. That's the id. Um, uh, your uh, uh, selfish sexual desires or desires for money or power or status that uh, are driving you and, and maybe counterproductive, that's your id, pushing you uh, to get those selfish, impulsive um, things. And uh, it's a very strong set of motivations that we all have to deal with to some degree. Uh, but that doesn't solely determine what we do, because otherwise we'd just be an animal, essentially. Um, we still have our frontal lobes, which we know now. But um, he also argued that this isn't the only thing that compels or motivates our behavior. It's also at odds with the superego which you can kind of think of as your, your conscience. So this is really strong when you're young, which is why uh, kids, according to Freud, had really poor self-control and why adults have better self-control because they develop a social, um, socialized, unconscious set of drives. So this is kind of like your conscience. Uh, this is your altruism, so your unselfishness, your willingness to help others. Even if it might be for your own gain, you realize you have to actually help others or you enjoy it. Uh, and this is uh, largely uh, taught or learned. Nonetheless, it is manifested, or sorry, it is established and does drive and affect your behavior. So like your decision to pick up a wallet you saw somebody drop and keep it yourself, there's gonna be a conflict of you wanting to keep the stuff in the wallet for yourself and you feeling bad and realizing that if you lost a wallet, you would prefer someone gave it back to you so you have this also uh, altruistic sort of Jiminy Cricket conscience on your shoulder and they sort of do battle and then your ego is what you actually do. It's you actually taking it and keeping it or taking it and giving it to them or taking it and taking some of it and give back to whatever it might be. That's your actual ego and these two forces are at, at odds to, uh, uh, to generate your actual behavior. So when we talk about personality, we'll talk a lot more about these two factors and how it actually affects your personality and your behavior. But we do need to know this because it is related to the stages at least somewhat. So again, these stages are disproven and, and, and not factual, uh, and his theories aren't <clears throat> accurate. But again, what's important is he tried to divide human development into developmental stages, which is a, is a, is a process and uh, perception that we apply today too, because we do see a lot of universal developmental milestones. And, as we talked with Conrad Lorenz, most of those are initiated. Um, in fact, all of those are initiated biologically. And then your environment does, of course, affect how your genes actually form and then what actions you are able to actually carry out or, or realize. So here are the stages of develop according to Freud. So the first stage, 0 to 18 months, 
is the stage called the oral stage. <clears throat> this is basically when babies use their mouths for everything. Whether it's eating, obviously, uh, you have like the rooting and sucking um, uh, instinct that they have initially, which is why mammals, of course, will immediately go for the mother's milk. Um, they chew on everything they get their hands on. They may even drool a lot till they can learn how to actually swallow their own drool, which takes a long time and can be frustrating when your baby's just drooling all over the place. But uh, yeah, you'll notice that young children, ages one to one and a half, obviously the older, the closer you get to one and a half, the less it occurs. They'll just take an object, and instead of like analyzing it, they just, they, they figure it out by biting it, uh, right? Because their teeth are coming into their source, they're trying to use them and make it not as uh, painful, right? Which has to do with the, the gateway theory. Um, if your tooth is painful, if you're using it and causing it to move and giving it sensation, that actually does limit the amount of pain signals that are sent. So the oral stage for, for uh, uh, kids is when pretty much everything uh, has to do with their, their mouths. They pretty much eat slash bite or suck everything. Right? Even if they look at it and use it, it's going in their mouth at some point. Uh, and that's what you got to watch out for. That's why you can't put things that are too small because they'll bite and potentially swallow them and choke on them or something that's toxic. Uh, or dirty, they might eat, so you've got to be, be careful during that phase. So that's the oral stage. Uh, then you have uh, what's called the anal stage, which is pretty much when kids are learning to potty train. They're learning how to control their bowel movements. So they're, um, you know, instead of just going in their diaper or, or wherever they are, they can feel the sensation of having to go. They have the self-control to hold back and go to the toilet uh, or wherever they're going to the bathroom, an appropriate place, and go there and then clean up be sanitary. So this is basically potty training. Uh, and that's uh, one to three. You can go to five technically, uh, but uh, one to three is generally when most kids start learning how to properly dispose of their human waste, not just going at a moment's notice on someone or, or in the room or whatever, in a proper location. Um, then we move on to a kind of confusing one. This is what he called the uh, Phallic stage, phallic stage. Um, and this is the stage at which most kids tend to prefer the attention and company of the opposite sex. So if you're a boy, this stage you generally prefer your mother. If you're a girl, at this stage you generally prefer your dad. Um, so that is preference for, for opposite sex parent. Uh, and you even see the same sex parent as your rival. Uh, and this is where Freud starts getting weird with his Electra complex and his Oedipus complex, where you like secretly are in love with your mother if you're, if you're a boy, or you're secretly in love with your father if you're a girl or whatever. Um, nonetheless, it is pretty common at this stage to have a slight preference for the opposite sex parent uh, during this phallic stage. All right, and we'll talk about how that might affect, according to Freud, uh, your behavior uh, in, in the future. Uh, next, we have from 6 to 11 months, we have what's called the latent stage. And what he means is latent is your sexual uh, maturity or desire. This is where um, boys and girls tend to prefer the presence of their same sex friends. So, this is where boys do the um, you know, no girls allowed stuff, or girls do the no boys allowed stuff, where all your friends, for the most part, are same sex, for the most part. Uh, and you're not sexually attracted to the opposite sex, which is what 97% you know, of people uh, end up doing. Of course, those 3% can vary whether it's bisexual or homosexual. But um, uh, back in Freud's day, homosexuality was not, it was very taboo. Um, so it was pretty much just heterosexual was the norm. And um, not even just the majority, which it still is today, but I mean like socially accepted norm. Uh, whereas today it's much more appropriately uh, open. Uh, late stage, you uh, prefer same sex friends and we see this in typical male uh, and female behavior and then about 12 months 12 years i have been doing months this whole time i'm sorry i meant to do years one to two years that probably makes more sense uh three to six years six to eleven years 12 years zero to 18 months is correct but from then on i meant to say years and i just kept saying months all right uh 12 years that's what's nice about having students here to correct me but i don't because of the quarantine so uh, 12 years is the uh, genital stage, meaning testes or ovaries. And um, this is basically just sexual maturity. So you'll still keep your same sex friends, but they start to matter significantly less. 
you are generally much more oriented in pursuing uh, your sexually mature drives. So for 97% of people, that means males prefer um, the attention and sexual relations with females and vice versa. And of course, you do have that 3% exception for bisexual uh, and homosexual people too. Nonetheless, that's sexual maturity uh, when you are now trying to find romantic partners and you are um, able to procreate, certainly not advised at this age, uh, but able to, and then later on when you're more stable, uh, it, it must be more, it's much more optimal to, uh, to uh, uh, re reproduce it into your mid to late 20s, generally speaking. All right, or early 30s. <clears throat> All right, that's the general stages. So Freud saw that as the normal sequence or stages of development, uh, and he believed you needed to properly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Stimulate yourself and master these stages in order to function what he referred to as normally uh, as far as development goes. So what happens if you don't, according to Freud? Freud argued that if any of these stages were not able to, the individual did not properly develop, so they didn't master whatever it was their task, whether it was, you know, uh, using their mouth or potty training or whatever, or they didn't receive adequate stimulation, like maybe not enough attention from their opposite sex partner in the phallic stage, or not enough attention from their same sex partner in the latent stage or, the, or friends, um, or they didn't master their potty training, uh, or they overindulged in any of these, it could actually affect their unconscious behavior. It could manifest itself, it could bind itself to the id, as a selfish drive or an unfulfilled drive, and it could unknowingly motivate uh, the ego to perform behaviors that are typical of these stages for adults. Let me, that probably didn't make that much sense. So what I wanna talk about here is Freud focused on how if you don't properly go through these stages, meaning you don't master the skill, you are overstimulated in some of these, or you are understimulated, meaning you didn't get enough stimulation, whether it was attention uh, or, or use, of your bowels uh, or, or chewing on enough things, whatever it might be, that um, you would sort of carry that with you into adulthood. And that that old phase that should have been played out in childhood may follow you unwillingly into adulthood. So that was called fixation. And that's when you manifest or carry out. Manifest means like you're actually putting into action, carrying out. Latent means it's hidden. You don't know about it. So that's like these um, um, uh, unconscious drives. Manifesting is when it's actually carried out. Uh, manifesting manifest a childhood stage. So oral stage, anal stage, phallic stage, or latent stage. Manifest childhood stage in adulthood. Uh, and this would be anachronistically too. Anachronistically means at the improper time. Spelled that wrong. Anachronistic. Uh, anachronistic means, again, you're carrying out at the wrong time. It should have been carried out earlier uh, or later, whatever it might be. But in, as in adulthood, all those things would be earlier, obviously. So uh, this would mean, for example, a person who did not receive proper stimulation in the oral phase as an adult might be addicted to um, oral fixation based things like cigarettes, gum chewing, chewing on their nails, um, sucking on their thumbs, whatever it might be. So any of these later stages, if they're manifesting oral stage uh, behaviors, that means this stage they did not develop properly, they were understimulated or overstimulated. Uh, for the anal stage, that would mean, uh, you know, after three years old, they're still wetting the bed, or they wet their pants and they get scared, they have an involuntary bowel movement when they got scared or whatever uh, in adulthood or, or later childhood, that would mean that they did not properly develop or were not properly stimulated in that um, anal stage. Again, these are non-confirmable slash disproven theories, but this is how Freud explained it. Phallic stage, for example, um, if you didn't get enough attention from your mother as a boy or you got too much attention, you might uh, be fixated on female attention as an adult and um, be overly concerned with uh, getting attention from females or vice versa. If you were a female who didn't get enough attention or too much attention from your father, you might be fixated on the phallic stage as an adult and be um, overzealous in your attempt to get male attention. Uh, again, disproven, but that, that's what they, they feel it might have been. Um, 
So that's basically what fixation was, and that's how he believed it affected your development. So again, we'll add that caveat. Um, believed improper uh, development or stimulation in a developmental stage resulted in abnormal fixated, right, fixation behaviors. So uh, you have this sort of uh, unrealized unconscious motive that's attached itself to your id because you're overstimulated, understimulated, or did not develop properly. So it's unknowingly being manifested in your behavior in the form of, like I said, nail biting, thumb sucking, cigarette smoking, wetting the bed, wetting uh, or having bowel movements when you're afraid or, or when you don't want to. Um, being overly concerned with male attention or female attention because you didn't get enough at the phallic stage from the opposite sex parent. Whatever it might be, uh, that's what he believed. So again, disproven, but nonetheless, he provided a great framework for viewing human development in these uh, milestone sort of um, developmental stages. And then, of course, Conrad Lorenz later is going to um, enhance that biologically by pointing out um, that maturation is a biologically initiated process. It does genuinely fit a timeline. Uh, and it does affect your behavior, uh, its maturation, essentially. All right, so there is somebody who's going to piggyback on um, this actual set of theories. It's a guy named Eric Erickson, and he has a whole bunch of stages. So um, he didn't necessarily agree with all of Freud's stages, per se, but Eric Erickson, who was just after Freud and, and still did believe that if you didn't properly develop during a certain stage, it would affect your development and behavior onwards. Uh, he went beyond just adolescence. So Freud kind of stopped at sexual maturity. Eric Erickson, again, believed a lot of the fundamentals of, of the id and the superego and Freud's theories, but he's going to say Freud was wrong to stop at adolescence. Development continues into adulthood. So Eric Erickson took a more not, I want to say broad because he is specific, but he took a, a, a larger scale look at human life uh, and the stages in it. So Eric Erickson. Uh, he did his field work primarily between the 1930s and 1970s. Uh, and he, um, his contributions, again, these aren't all entirely correct. And both of these guys make some errors like um, not finding or noting the causal relationship between biology and behavior. They, they primarily were fixated on social development and experience and didn't really mention or, or give any uh, credibility or credit to biology in this. So that's one of their major errors. But again, um, Erickson does have a good broad set of general healthy developments and issues you deal with at certain stages of your life. So these aren't, you know, um, this isn't, you know, golden words, nothing to specifically live by and worry about, but these are some general developmental um, epochs or periods in human life that Erickson has noted going across life. And by the way, he, he, uh, he was profoundly uh, um, interested in looking cross-culturally. So he didn't just look at um, Western civilization, he looked uh, Native American civilizations. I believe he did some field work outside of the West too, in either Africa and or Asia, at least to some degree. Uh, but he's gonna take a multicultural look at this uh, and he's going to uh, develop a stage-based uh, lifespan developmental timeline. And again, um, he did share a lot of the same views of Freud as far as the unconscious goes, um, at least initially. Uh, but he is going to be correct in identifying some of the conflicts that people have to deal with in these developmental stages. And the fact that if you struggle in any of these stages, it can, it can actually affect your life negatively. But again, this isn't something you have to uh, take as, as holy, holy gospel or, or, or whatever it might be. So because there's so many stages, and that would take a ridiculous amount of time for you to write all of these that, uh, that you guys are just watching here, looking at me, write these. I'm gonna write these up real quick and then go back and explain them uh, after they're already written up there. Uh, and we'll talk about them one by one. All right, so Eric Erickson sort of laid out eight general developmental um, stages as people go throughout their lives. And there's a degree of truth to each of these, 
uh, as far as how to best facilitate it. But again, these aren't uh, have all end all um, stages that everyone has to uh, progress through in the same amount of time or in the same way. Um, so just a quick example, there's a couple things about competency or leadership. Uh, we know now for sure that based on our extensive trait personality studies that um, people are predisposed to be, to want to be or be good leaders or competent. Um, so your social setting certainly can deny you of that if you're lacking nutrition or education or stability or your you know, um, epigenetics have negatively affected your, your, your genes and development. Absolutely, uh, it, that's something that could affect it, but what you actually enjoy doing and are good at uh, is, is there's a, a profoundly um, large causal factor that's um, linked to uh, genetics and biology. Nonetheless, let's go through them. So uh, zero to 18, this is uh, the stage when you are going to uh, form a basic uh, trust uh, with, with parents. So obviously zero to 18, the kid is completely dependent. Now you'll notice that all these time frame is the same as Freud, just continues past puberty. Um, so he doesn't focus on the sexual nature of it as much as Freud, in fact, doesn't almost at all. Uh, Freud's very fixated himself on the actual uh, sexualized uh, topics. Um, but he uses the same relative time frames and, and, and is a little, little bit more nuanced in his understanding of them. So basic trust is something that Eric Erickson views as um, very important. And he's actually right, not for the right reasons, but he's actually correct here. And we've talked about this before too, I believe. Yes, we did. We talked about the, the Harry Harlow uh, experiments and, and attention and affection. So here at the 0 to 18th month mark, 18 month mark, this is where a, an infant develops a positive relationship with the parent, meaning they know that the parent is gonna be affectionate, uh, reliable, and attend to, their, attend to their needs. And he believes that this is where you form your basic trust of society or mistrust. So parents that give their babies adequate attention and affection, allow their children to know they can depend on their parents and others in the world, and that their, uh, the world is generally uh, good and capable of improvement. If they're denied those things, they will experience confusion, instability, or mistrust of the world and or their parents. And we actually know too biologically now, uh, thanks to the unethical uh, experiments of Harry Harlow uh, and others on easy and difficult babies, that um, that really does actually affect the development physically, uh, which of course affects their maturation and development. So that's basic trust, and that's the stage here where you have to be able to rely on your parents for attention and affection, and that can actually negative effect away you negatively affect you if you don't. So if you do, you gain that basic trust, understanding of the world is a good place, and mistrust is it's confusing, unreliable, and potentially bad. All right, uh, one to three, rather than focusing on, um, specifically on the potty training, uh, it does have to do with potty training though. This is where a kid will learn to uh, practice uh, some degree of independence, dependence expansion. So you're not entirely independent, obviously, but one to three is where kids start being able to do things on their own. So this is where, it's important you do teach kids how to properly um, use the toilet, potty train them. This is where you want them to start doing things on their own, like dressing themselves, picking their own clothes, uh, pouring their own drinks, or if they can, or cutting their own food, obviously with supervision. Uh, you wanna grant them as much independence as possible, because this is where they start to identify uh, with their own ability and their own independence, rather than being uh, shameful and thinking that they can't do things, or they're not capable, uh, or, or they, they're wrong for doing so. So it's important that you do foster that independence. Some individuals are more independent than others, uh, obviously. And we know that from, from years of analysis on, on intelligence and personality. Nonetheless, you should attempt to make students as students, uh, children as re reliant on themselves as possible and, and resilient, and that's an important stage for doing that. So again, just basic personal choice uh, and, and agency, potty training, uh, food, uh, eating, presenting, cleaning up after themselves, choosing their own clothes, things like that. Uh, three to five years is the initiative versus guilt phase. This is where they uh, generally start entering society on the preschool level. So this is where you want to encourage students, I could say students now, but children, um, you want to encourage them to try to do what they want with other people. They're going to have to weigh their interests, and this is where kids figure that out, of where, oh, Am I a good leader? Do I like leading? Do I prefer to follow? Or whatever it might be. Uh, this is where you want students or kids to uh, um, cultivate independence and leadership further. 
And again, not everybody's a natural leader or wants to be or can be, uh, but if they are, uh, you should encourage that. Uh, and if you don't do that, then they start feeling, if they, <clears throat> they start feeling like if they have an idea or they try to make people do things or run the show or make decisions that they're actually uh, bad at it or uh, they are imposing themselves on others uh, or their desires and needs don't matter. So this is where you want them to voice it, uh, to push themselves, do what they want, lead, um, and, and, and follow their own course. Basically this whole thing here from stages two to four is uh, you want to encourage um, progress and independence uh, as a teacher or a parent, because uh, that's a very important uh, stage. Or you could extend that also to stage five, which we'll get to, but that's a common theme here is you want to encourage them and push them forward to be as independent uh, as possible and in, in, in acting out their own uh, desires and agency and figuring out how the world works, right? Because you can't just walk in and even as, a, as a, somebody who naturally wants to be there and just start barking out orders, no one's going to, at least over time, listen to you. So you're gonna have to figure out that doesn't work. Uh, and that's where you do this. Uh, next one, is where kids are a little more sophisticated. This is where they start noticing things that they are better at than others or worse at than others. And people start to value them uh, for their competency, uh, what they're good at. So here's where uh, kids are going to uh, figure out natural uh, weaknesses and strengths. And that can be wonderful, especially the strengths, because that's going to really encourage kids and they're going to really value how other people value their abilities, whether it's their speed or their intelligence or their, 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 their personality, whatever it might be. Um, they're going to feel very proud of that and they're going to, uh, of course, want to use that. They want uh, recognition for that. But what you have to watch out for is that you don't discourage them. So when they do fail at something, it's okay to fail but you teach them to keep going and that they can actually improve that. That doesn't mean that they're inferior, right? Or they're, they're broken or incompetent. So here, it's both a wonderful, um, but also a, an important phase. It's a wonderful phase, but also one that's important to teach them the right attitude to have. Uh, so you encourage them to be dependent, to use their abilities, uh, to, to, to improve them, but also let them know that just because somebody else might naturally be better at something, doesn't mean that they can't be better or that they're broken or incompetent or inferior. Uh, everybody has different things that they're naturally good at. And you can also, of course, work to improve them and make your weaknesses less of a weakness or enhance your strengths. And also, too, it's important to teach them just because they're naturally better at something doesn't make them superior either. Uh, they might have an advantage, but other people can catch up um, and they can outpace them eventually or develop skills or, or, or refine them. And there are proper ways to use them. Uh, being cocky, arrogant, um, or dismissive is not a, a good way to live um, as far as fostering good relationships and, and a general likability and sociability with others. So that's an important phase too, to not let your kids get too discouraged, but also don't let them get too uh, uh, cocky or, or, or inflated as far as their ego goes. Uh, ego meaning self um, concept, like who they are and what they're good at uh, and their ability. Next one is uh, adolescence. So this is kind of where Freud sort of stopped on the um, uh, sexual maturation portion of puberty. Uh, but this one is um, more important for parents to uh, foster independence and room. Independence and uh, room for exploration. Because here, you have a lot of hormonal surges that can affect uh, their moods and behavior. So males, like I said, will get more aggressive. Uh, females have more fluctuations in their moods than they're previously used to. And then, of course, you have the um, bodily changes that come along with puberty. So here it's really important that you allow kids to uh, find out who they are because they're going to be somewhat confused at this phase of their life as far as what they want to do, what they're actually good at, what they can do, uh, what their value is to society, um, where they want to go in their life, what things that they actually like. Oh, here's a new thing. So instead of just cutting them off from it and, and as a parent or a teacher and not letting them experience it because you say it's wrong or bad or whatever, um, Obviously, with some exceptions, you don't want them going off and storting cocaine, doing much heroin. That could kill them. Uh, but as far as like exploring other interests or activities or even friends, uh, you should grant as much independence as possible. Because if you don't, and there's some truth to this that Erickson uh, noted, if you don't, then they will resent you, intentionally rebel, and they will go off and do things that are potentially dangerous because they think that you are confining and limiting them. So that will make them more confused, 
more resentful, uh, and more potentially rebellious. Whereas if you sort of embrace it and let them go out and explore um, uh, optimally or reasonably, uh, they're going to develop their own sense of independence and confidence in who they are, and they're less likely to be erratic or, or rebellious in their behavior. So foster independence and room for exploration, or they'll be confused and resentful uh, and potentially uh, danger to themselves or others. All right, <clears throat> now going into adulthood. This is a fairly big phase, and obviously people can go through these phases in different segments of time and, and reach them at a different uh, in time, but um, this is a general phase where most people, uh, and they, they begin focusing here, but it gets especially important here. When you leave high school, you're not surrounded by the same people who are your age and you've grown up with. You actually now are in the world uh, more so, even if you do go to college. There's a large, larger variance in age and people. They're not the same people. They're constantly changing. So here is where people attempt to form uh, lasting relationships uh, and careers. But we'll focus more on the relationships here. So whether it's romantic relationships or it's just a really close, trusting, long-lasting quality friendship, can be either. That's where people um, are focused and they, generally speaking, need to develop that. You need to foster some sort of lasting, meaningful, romantic relationship or friendship. Otherwise, uh, you risk uh, falling into the uh, latter half of this, which is isolation, where people feel alone, separated, depressed uh, about that, and that can negatively affect their health and development as well. So here's where you start figuring out who you want to actually keep around regarding friends, who you actually want to uh, maybe start a family with uh, or get married to or have a, as a long-term romantic partner. Uh, and that becomes the focus. And people that fail to do that, of course, end up becoming frustrated, feeling isolated, uh, depressed, um, and alienated by, by society and others. So that's why it's important to develop that in that phase of life. All right, secondly, or secondly, uh, the seventh um, um, category, uh, stage of development, is uh, kind of where you might see people, according to Erickson, experience that midlife crisis. This is where you're kind of past the halfway point in life, uh, maybe not numerically, but certainly based on your ability to uh, uh, produce things and contribute to society. Um, once you start getting past your 70s, that becomes increasingly difficult because your physical health uh, and your cognition begin to deteriorate deteriorate and decline significantly, even if you end up living to 100 or beyond. So you might not be at the chronological halfway point, but you're certainly at or beyond the halfway point as far as your uh, exceptionally product productive uh, uh, and capable of life. So here is where people either feel like they have successfully gone to these stages, they have uh, established a meaningful career and or family, and here they're focused on um, cultivating or generating value in the next generation or at their job that will extend beyond their life. All right, so here you start realizing that, all right, I'm only gonna get older and my time in my field or family as far as being relevant is limited, it's dwindling, coming to a close. So here it's important that people feel like these prior phases were meaningful and they were on the right path. They formed these lasting relationships. They have meaningful family or, or friendships and a career. And they can now extend that into projects or people that will outlast them. So uh, projects or career uh, discoveries or innovations that will continue to help people um, and, 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 and build their reputation or you know, establishing uh, families and raising kids that will continue on a, a legacy of, of, of positive pro-social behavior and making the world better, whatever it might be. So a focus on, on relationships or career, uh, career accomplishments that will outlast life. And unfortunately for people that hit this phase of life and they don't feel like they've done it, like they haven't reached their potential or they've wasted some time or their work or their family relationships are not significant and won't carry on their legacy or a positive legacy, that's where they begin to start feeling like they haven't done enough. So they start going for radical changes like trying to relive old phases or um, trying to seem like they are successful or seem like they've had an impact uh, by going on trips or buying things or changing their behavior or or, or, or radically uh, abandoning these things that they've been attached to. Uh, that's where you get the stagnation. We feel like you haven't kept up with 
what you wanted to, you're not significant, you didn't make uh, meaningful contributions, so you either give up or you start over or you completely stagnate and, and fall into depression. All right, in the last phase, which is about retirement age, where people generally voluntarily or due to uh, a declining ability or health, they um, pull out of the uh, career phase of their life and maybe even the, uh, you know, now their kids have kids so they aren't even raising kids anymore. Uh, their grandparents or great grandparents. This is where they can't contribute as much to society as they did before, but this is the phase where you hope that the people who reach this point feel fulfilled by what they have done. So this is where integrity, where you go into life developing wisdom in that you've successfully gone through life, you're happy with what you've accomplished, you feel like you've done all the things you want to do, and now you can um, enjoy that post-contribution phase, maybe even offer advice or wisdom to others, or you fall into despair as if you've wasted your life, uh, you wasted your time, you wasted your activities, you didn't reach your potential, um, your life was meaningless, um, or not as meaningful as you wanted it to be, uh, and you might be bitter or resentful or fall into depression uh, and despair there as well. So um, positive, <clears throat> meaningful reflection on past slash existence slash contribution uh, or legacy. And again, if you don't look back and you feel like you haven't reached your potential or you wasted time or you didn't accomplish anything or your life wasn't meaningful, you're going to be either bitter or resentful or fall into despair. So again, um, <clears throat> Erickson, does de develop sort of a, a general lifespan development for most people. You're gonna have some variance because again, uh, and it's important to know this, uh, both Freud and Erickson, being that they existed at the time they existed, didn't have access to a lot of the information from the cognitive revolution or evolutionary psychology. Um, they also lived during an era that blatantly denied biological influences because they feared you know, the social Darwinist, um, uh, Nazi connection that, that, that was negatively associated with biological explanations for behavior, which are totally wrong, but also false and incorrect, um, along with being unethical and immoral, um, they are going to uh, largely um, neglect or exclude biological influence and personality uh, but he does present a, a, a rather generic but semi-accurate stage of developmental sequences that most people experience at those ages. And certainly, you can fall onto the positive or negative side of that depending on your life and your personality and your past and what you've accomplished, haven't accomplished. But again, our personality has a lot to do with that. So the people that are more extroverted experience more positive emotion. At this phase, they're much more likely to uh, reflect back positively on those events because they'll remember those events. Whereas people that are higher in neuroticism, which is your, basically your sensitivity to negative emotion, which we'll talk about with the personality, they're much more likely to look back reflecting on the negative uh, and are more likely to, even if they're not necessarily correct, view things as a waste of time or a lack of potential or, or, or insignificant or, or unmeaningful, essentially. So there's, there's a lot of factors that they weren't aware of, didn't have access to, but nonetheless, <clears throat> it's a good, uh, past framework and general time span development uh, for most people. And they were correct about a few things, like for example, this basic trust. Uh, and in these two phases, how you shift from a parent uh, to peer uh, relationships and romantic relationships, that's absolutely correct um, based on what we know now. But nonetheless, <clears throat> there, this, is, this is fairly vague. Uh, certainly not a by-the-book, step-by-step process that everyone needs to go through, and it doesn't really include um, temperament and personality, as well as our biological and evolutionary uh, psychology understandings of, of our behavior. But that's Eric Erickson, uh, that was Freud, and that's how those two sort of gave us a, a, a new way uh, to look at uh, human development uh, across um, lifetimes as going through stages, and of course, if you add in the Conrad the Rents, uh, biological explanation for uh, developmental stages, critical periods, and maturation. Um, a lot of this um, sort of makes sense, at least broadly. 
Um, so what we'll go over next is uh, specific developmental um, stages that we know quite a bit about and are linked uh, to biology, um, starting with uh, cognitive development, PJ, and then we'll go into moral development, which emerged with uh, Lawrence Kohlberg and then was disputed and criticized and corrected um, by Jonathan Haidt and also at the time was uh, criticized by uh, Carol Gilligan. So we'll talk about those and that's it for development. <clears throat>